I knew him as uh, mayor of the city of Jamestown. Are you recording? Yeah. Oh, yep. okay. I knew him uh, as mayor of the city of Jamestown. Um, I was a 16-year-old, um, 17 maybe at the most, probably 16. Uh, and he facilitated with uh, Sam Nelbone in allowing me to sit through contract negotiations uh, for the city of Jamestown and the police union at that time. Tom Truso was the union representative, Sam Nelbone was the city's ombudsman. Uh, the ombudsman was a position created by Stan Lundin uh, back in the day, very creative uh, in, uh, in adopting that position. Uh, but the ombudsman, besides being a problem solver, the traditional model for an ombudsman was also the personnel administrator at that time. And 16 years old, I actually got to sit in City Hall and learn how to cost out a contract, um, and uh, it served me well. It, it, it whetted my appetite for doing labor work later because Stan Lundin with Sam Nelbone said it'd be a nice idea to have me try to work with them like that. Mm -hmm. So if you were working probably very closely with Stan, you knew about, obviously, the Labor Management Committee. Can yes. you tell me more about that and how that impacted Jamestown? Sure. Uh, my father-in-law, Joe Mason, was close friends with uh, Stan, and my father-in-law, Joe Mason, was the co-chair uh, of the Labor Management Committee. He was the union chair. Uh, Stan Lundin had a knack for finding, and always has, uh, finding the right people at the right time to make things happen in Jamestown. He just uh, was remarkable, and uh, my father-in-law was one of those people. Um, along the way, um, he set up what was to be probably the biggest change in labor management relations in the United States by setting up this committee. And I'll never forget turning on the national news one day and they were featuring what Stan had set up in Jamestown, New York. Uh, in labor terms, uh, Stan put uh, the city on the map, uh, being a leader in the forefront of labor management uh, committees. The concept was pretty simple. Um, it's as hard as it is simple. Uh, labor and management should sit together, stand thought, and talk out their problems like a mediation format. And there were mediations long before the Labor Management Committee, but nobody had applied it institutionally on a day-to-day -day basis to make a local factory, a local business work better by having employees have an opportunity to discuss their day-to-day -day working issues with their managers in a non-confrontational uh, setting. Uh, contract negotiations can be, uh, can be confrontational and difficult. Uh, Stan's idea was to have labor management be more than just a contract negotiations once every three-year opportunity, but rather a continuous opportunity to talk about day-to-day -day labor relations issues. We'll never know for sure how many non-cases occurred, in other words, that there weren't more conflicts and issues, but I'm absolutely sure that his creating the labor management concept, the dynamic of that prevented many, many day-to-day, -day, month to month issues in the workplace because labor and management had a chance to talk about their um, differences in a non-confrontational setting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the title for my exhibit is Stan Lundin Leading with Integrity and in Innovation. Do you think that's a good title that represents what Stan Lundin stood for as mayor and congressman? Uh, I have hearing aids. Oh, that's Okay, so I'm losing you a little bit. So do that question again. So the title for my exhibit is Stan Lundin, Leading with Integrity and Innovation. Do you think that's a good title that kind of represents what Stan stood for? Yes. Um, the integrity point, I would put an exclamation point, maybe five exclamation points. Um, I came back in 1984 to work on Stan's campaign for Congress. And one of the key things you have to do when you run for office is you have to 
identify what your policy positions are on the critical issues. And I remember working with Stan, or Stan working and telling me what he was going to do, more like writing out the 10 top questions that he would be asked in debates in the campaign trail and what his answers would be. And I remember the dialogue going back and forth, and I had practiced law for about three and a half years in Washington at that time. And I came back with, with, for Stan's campaign to run his campaign for the 39th Congressional District at that time. And I remember Stan's uncompromising comments about what his positions would be on issues, even when some of his positions were not necessarily politically popular. He didn't conform to what people thought he should say, but rather took positions based on what he thought was appropriate and right for the interests of, of the people in the 39th Congressional District. Um, coming out, uh, out of the blocks and starting with him, I was struck by that. Uh, and I think, you know, when we talked about potential issues, et cetera, he was always concerned about his integrity in doing the right thing, not necessarily the politically expedient thing. Uh, I think uh, a lot of politicians in Washington today uh, could take a lesson from Stan Lundy, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I agree. Um, what adjectives would you use to describe Stan? Um, I don't know, um, I'll just describe it as I, as I feel it, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, adjectives. Um, I think he is, uh, in my mind, one of the uh, highest, uh, uh, people of highest integrity I've ever worked with. Um, I think he is a genuine man who cares about doing what's right. I think um, in terms of seeing the future and his intelligence, uh, uh, people don't talk about it, but that's a very, very smart man, Stan Lundy. Um, he was able to work in the international banking area, agriculture area. He could switch out of various areas in Congress and frankly um, master the area of law, I mean, frankly, uh, readily and not with a, a lot of to do. I mean, it just, it seemed to me, uh, he was one of the smartest men I had ever worked with. And I worked with, uh, uh, in Washington, with some very, very smart people. And on a lawyer level, I thought that he was a 10. Uh, I thought that, um, frankly, as a practicing lawyer, I would have loved to see him argue cases at the U.S. State, uh, U.S. Supreme Court because I think he would have been one of the practicing, uh, best practicing lawyers in that court. Just a smart guy, mm -hmm. simple as that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's easier to be a congressman if you're smart. Uh, and I think he did that job with ease because, number one, he had intuitive intelligence, and number two, he had an instinct for bringing the best people around him. Uh, the people who worked with him, his staff uh, that I got to work with, uh, to this day, having practiced law now for 37 years, I can tell you that the group that worked for Stan were 100% loyal to him because he was 100% loyal to them, and he always picked people that, frankly, he could trust and they were the staff and they now are my friends of long standing. Uh, I miss working with those people because they were 100% committed to Stan. And that loyalty proposition about watching out for Stan was something that stuck with me. Uh, professionally, you want people around you that uh, are comfortable with you and your integrity and that are loyal to your commitment to the people you serve. And that was his staff and Stan had the ability to pick those people. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about his mayoral, his campaign for mayor and the blue ribbon ticket? Do you know anything? Little before my time. Uh, I know of it. Uh, I know the um, Buffalo News uh, blew it up big time uh, that you had this young mayor coming in with this blue ribbon ticket and it was going to move and had moved Jamestown in a uh, strong positive position. Um, I don't know much about um, the background there because I was pretty young at the time, but I know that, it, uh, again, 
put Jamestown on the map that they had this progressive uh, Democratic leader that put together a ticket that was uh, frankly pretty uh, impressive and that's about what I know. That's good to know that the Buffalo News has an article. I should look into finding that. It, 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 it was it was kind of like a whiz kids article. Mm. It was something like that. Um, I wish I had it, but I don't think I do. Okay. Uh, it, it's out there. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's something like a, the headline, you'll like the headline if you can find the darn thing. Sorry. No, that's all right. I'll try to email their archives or give them a call later. Uh, what do you think his greatest accomplishment as mayor was? Um, hmm. That's a tough one for me again because I was a kid. Yeah. Um, you know, frankly, uh, I look at beautiful City Hall. Um, I think that that's a physical manifestation of his accomplishments. But I think his redesign of downtown Jamestown was remarkable. Um, I think his uh, ideas about how to develop Jamestown uh, for the future were uh, ahead of his time. Um, uh, in terms of moving the city forward, I think it was the aura of uh, Stan Lundeen bringing success to Jamestown. The present mayor reminds me of Stan Lundin that way because they both strive uh, from their heart to make Jamestown a jewel. And I think uh, Stan uh, and, and Sam, the current mayor, uh, make the point that Jamestown is a, a jewel and is a special place. I think with, with Stan, starting with Stan and then uh, again with the current mayor, I think you get the direct impression when you uh, talk with people that Jamestown can make things happen. They had that reputation, Stan had it, Sam has it, and despite the economics and the difficulty uh, of the you know, the demographics sometimes, um, they never blink. The uh, Stan's I think most known for making, James, making things happen in Jamestown, like the current mayor. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about the special election of 1976 when Hastings resigned? Yeah, not me. Not you? Yeah. I graduated in 73. I'm at Cornell in 76. Okay. okay. I then, wish I knew something about it, but I really don't. When did you jump on to Stan's campaign for Congress? For 84. 84? Yep. It's, um, I'm practicing law. Uh, I graduated uh, from law school in 81. Um, Stan was looking for a campaign manager. I was interested in coming back to Jamestown and uh, a mutual friend of ours, Patty Fiorello, uh, who with her husband has a uh, campaign uh, uh, consulting company in Washington, uh, bumped into me in Washington and said, you know, Stan's looking for a campaign manager and I said, I'm looking for a way to come home. Um, and we connected, we talked, and Stan gave me a, gave me a try. And uh, I'm forever indebted to Stan Lundin. He uh, trusted me. I took the responsibility they gave me very seriously. Um, I was daunted by seeing all the people and the kind of people we had, and I wasn't sure that I was up to that measure. Uh, but the thing about Stan Lundin is he'll let you make your way uh, and he did, and uh, I hope, and I don't think I did, I hope I didn't disappoint him. So what was it like, the campaign, setting up the campaign and managing that in the hustle and bustle of Washington, D.C., and also being here at home in this district? Um, running Stan's campaign was um, thermonuclear. <laughs> uh, the Republican Party had targeted the race, um, and the word was that they were going to spend $300,000 in 1984 to unseat Stan Lundin. At that point, I believe he would have been, if he wins, he's a five-term incumbent. 
He's a five-term incumbent in 1984, uh, if he wins. Uh, the candidate was uh, connected politically through her husband and through her, and her, her own political activities back in 84 um, with the state Republican committee. So it was clearly an effort to make sure that they could, uh, frankly, replace Stan. So there's a lot of pressure in the, in the campaign, to say the least. Um, it was fun. Uh, Stan uh, isn't afraid to work. So working for Stan Lundin, you feel like the person you're working for is going to work as hard or harder than you. And um, I like that. Um, I like to, to think of myself as being a pretty hardworking uh, gentleman. So working with Stan was like a mutual. We kind of fed off each other. Um, I will tell you that he ran the show, even though I was the campaign manager. Um, he directed the campaign, and um, that was the right thing because, he, frankly, it's it's his interest in making sure that he's going to be in Congress again. Um, we had some interesting episodes during the campaign, and um, that are funny. Um, one of them early on was whether he should or shouldn't accept money, and I think it was from the machinist union at the time. Um, at that time, you're allowed, I believe, to accept $5,000 before the primary as a campaign contribution from a union and 5000 after for the general election, um, and that's what the law required. And what had happened was uh, Stan was viewed as a strong advocate of working people. Okay? So the machinist union was very interested in helping him because they thought that, frankly, he would stand up for the interests of working people. He was good working advocate, working person advocate. Long story short, um, he was asked to, um, if he would accept a contribution of $5,000, the maximum. So Stan raised the question at our campaign meeting, uh, was there his public relations officer, myself, and a couple other uh, key people, do you think, he asked us, do you think I should take the $5,000? because he did not want to appear beholden to unions. And I understand that. And one of the people at the table said, no way, 5,000, if you take the max both times, it'll look like you have to do what the unions want you to do. And Stan turned to me and said, Chuck, what do you think? And I had, of course, uh, some people know, and Stan, of course, knew I had worked for unions and had been working for a union as an attorney before I came back. Stan said, so what do you think, Chuck? I put my hands up like horns and I said, take the money. <laughs> Everyone laughed. Stan laughed. And it was just one of those moments where everybody says to themselves, now we have a campaign for, that we have to oppose and we have to raise $300,000 in a difficult area to raise that kind of money in 1984. Uh, so how are we going to do it if we start saying no to people? Uh, that are willing to contribute, and most importantly, I never thought, and I know I'm right, that Stan Lundin was beholden to anybody. The fact that he would take a campaign contribution does not mean that he was committed to voting wrong. He would always vote right. And if the machinist union was wrong on an issue, he wouldn't have followed them. So the, taking the $5,000 didn't bother me from a integrity principal point of view, and I thought it was just good business to run a campaign and accept contributions, unless there was some personal objection to the cause of the people who were backing you. Mm -hmm. Two other inc incidents that are funny about that campaign, Stan was, and some of this is pretty current, Stan was dyed in the wool, USA, America products, American, by American only. Me too. I'm a big union guy, I believe in that 100%. Well, we decided to get Stan Lundin hats, white hat with his royal blue designed uh, uh, insignia uh, colors. He had a color that he used that was a little different than other blues, and it was Stan Lundin blue. So we put that on the stand, on the sign of Lundin for Congress on the front of the hat, and I ordered the hats. And I, I don't think it was a ton of them, but I'll bet you it was two, three hundred hats. The hats come in a big box, I mean, a huge box. I open the box and I look at the tabs. I bought them from a, a local, through a local company. Um, and it was like, I thought I was buying local hats, okay? And the hats come in 
and the little white tab tag on it says made in China. My uh, wife of uh, at that point, uh, seven years, and I spent all night with razor blades cutting out the Made in China tax. Oh. It was <laughs> it was one of the funniest moments of my life that that I, you know you pay attention to detail, and then something like that happens. Um, I honestly don't know. Stan might be learning this for the first time today on this tape. I'm not even sure I told him, <laughs> but there were no Made in China tags on the Stan London hat. And then the last funny episode was, and it's more, uh, even more uh, common today, um, the question back then was, well, what if it's a tough race? Because it was expected that he was going to get a run for his money from this other candidate, which didn't happen. Uh, the other candidate, uh, Stan, basically crushed the other candidate uh, in the numbers. It wasn't wasn't close. It was projected to be close. They were telling us, like they've said lately, that the polls were close, etc. Not. Uh, Stan had a great following and, and, and beat uh, the opponent readily. But you don't know going into election day. So commonly people would mail, campaigns would mail to, um, and it was less common then than it is today, uh, you do a lot of absentee mailings, absentee ballot mailings, so that anybody who got an absentee ballot would get a mailing wherever they were, reminding them that we got this great congressman in Jamestown, New York, even though you're in Texas and you're going to vote by absentee ballot, don't forget Stan Lundy. Uh, back then it wasn't as common, like I said, to mail today absentee ballot, uh, uh, people that receive absentee ballots get lots of campaign mailings. We're walking out of um, one of uh, our offices that we were meeting in. It's election night. The pressure is up to here about whether Stan's going to win or not. We have no idea. And Stan turned to me as we were walking to the campaign headquarters and said, Chuck, did that uh, mailing go out to the absentee ballot uh, people? And I said, absentee ballots? And he went, oh my, and you could see the look on his face, the blood drained out of his face. We didn't get an absentee ballot mailing out. Um, it was one of those moments when I thought, uh, I thought Stan was going to fall over. <laughs> but he won readily without that. Um, it's uh, today in retrospect, you would say that, uh, oh my, of course you mail. Back then it wasn't that common. It was something that you think about, uh, but, you know, frankly, uh, funny or not funny at the time, it didn't get done. <laughs> oh, man. Um, what do you think his greatest accomplishment as a representative was in his time in Congress? I think he had an outstanding record on the banking issues and agriculture issues, and I think that he was forward-looking about the challenges of being a, a farmer. I still tell people that I represent farm, farmers today that Stan Lundin was way out of his time in recognizing that the small farm was under threat. And if we didn't do something about changing our policies, that there would not be any small farms in the future. Unfortunately, Stan was right. but. The farmers in particular, and I think, you know, it's, it's a soft spot for me that he was always looking out for the little guy. And I think his biggest accomplishment was, uh, besides labor management relations, which I'll get to in a minute, was watching out for the local business people, the smaller businesses that were not mega corporations. Uh, additionally, I think that uh, he revolutionized uh, the world of labor relations with the labor management concept. And I think um, we'll never know how many non-issues, like I said earlier, um, were solved, uh, but I know it's uh, probably in the thousands across the country. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. They're good questions, by the way, Ashley. Very good. Tough questions. Good. Very, very good questions. Thank you. You're right on. <laughs> Do you know anything about Stan's time as Lieutenant Governor in 84 when he joined up with Mario Cuomo? 
Um, my limit of knowledge there is that uh, Stan had asked a, a core group of us to go with him to the state democratic convention. And I have a funny story about that too. And we went to the convention floor and um, our core group is all about Stan Lundy. Mario Cuomo's a nice guy, but we're there for Stan Lundin, and my duty of loyalty, my focus of loyalty was 100% uh, on Stan Lundin. So we understood that the TV cameras were going to be uh, facing from the sides, etc., when Stan was out on the, uh, uh, on the stage, and then we were looking at the audience, among other pictures, directly at him. So I had taken a lot of Lundin signs with us for Lieutenant Governor. And uh, again, the, the blue signs, uh, Stan Lundin blue. And we took our 10, 15, 20 people that were the core group that went with them. And I stationed everybody like a V with signs so that when they looked out at the crowd, the TV cameras would look at the crowd to see who was there for Stan Lundin. All you could see is Lundin signs. You couldn't see a Cuomo sign. And the Cuomo people were seated behind us because we had created a V, so you couldn't see behind. One of the um, campaign people for Mario Cuomo noticed that and uh, came over and, and asked me, um, where's the Cuomo signs? And I said, uh, I um, don't have any Cuomo signs. I'm here for Stan Lundin. And his comment back was, well, this is a Cuomo event, and uh, you, you need to be focused on, uh, you know, Mario Cuomo, too. And I said, uh, that's after Stan Lundin talks. <laughs> right now, it's all about Stan Lundin. And he walked away. And that was the end of it. But again, you know what? Stan Lundin had that effect, I think, on people. Um, he would stand by you 100% and you felt a duty of loyalty to stand up for him. And it was, uh, it was fun, it was a fun convention. Um, Mario Cuomo's people were very organized, they do a great job. It was a pleasure to work with the, their, their people also because uh, they're hard charging and we were hard charging for Stan. So it was, it was, it was fun, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your favorite story about or with Stan? Your favorite story about or with Stan? Um, I'd say, you know, I'd say it, uh, it's the uh, campaign story of the, uh, the uh, take the $5,000 and uh, followed up by the, uh, the Made in China hats. <laughs> Those are two fun, fun things associated with Stan. Um, in our later years, we've had socially a lot of nice times together at Buffalo Bills games. Uh, Stan adopted our group. We adopted Stan as part of our group. There's about 10, 12 of us that have gone to the Bills games for 30 years, uh, approximately. Uh, additionally, we went to all four Super Bowls. Uh, Stan would uh, always help us with Super Bowl tickets. And so all of us could go, um, and uh, it was just uh, on a personal, social basis. Stan Lending uh, can make friends with anybody, and you always feel wonderful to be around Stan and Sarah. And I can't say enough about everybody that worked with him over the years. That's my, my favorite, favorite story is that Stan introduced me to people that have been lifelong friends that watched out for me. At that point in my life, in high school to college, um, they called me Chucky, and uh, I remember a reporter, uh, Manley Anderson, back in the day, commenting uh, uh, in a story that I was Chucky from Allen Street. Uh, a lot of that came from the people that worked for Stan Lundin uh, being supportive of me as a young man who was trying to make his way into college and then into a professional career. Um, I don't know what would have happened with me if I hadn't crossed paths with these people, at, uh, including, of course, Stan, to say the least. He uh, had a lot to do with my future, and I am forever, forever grateful and indebted to Stan Lundy. He's one of the best things that ever happened to me.